So hello. Uh, so this is a short summary presentation of authentic assessment in a Gen AI world. And really the purpose of this talk is to consider two forms of assessment, in this case, case studies and multiple choice question examinations, and how we can create those in a world where students have access to the internet. And of course, on the internet, generative artificial intelligence tools like ChatGTP. So really the pedagogic underpinning of this talk would be authentic assessment. So what do I mean by authentic assessment? So it's a term that is well debated in the literature, but broadly means equipping the students with the knowledge, skills, competencies in the assessment that would have got direct relationships or synergies with those same knowledge, skills and competencies that they need in the workforce or in a professional setting. So you kind of got a dual purpose in the way that you've constructed the assessment. I mean, a typical type of assessment that is authentic would be things like a case study or a live brief, perhaps a portfolio, uh, intray exercise, those kind of things. Um, if you're really interested in authentic assessment, um, I've got another short talk on authentic assessment um, and its approaches, which I'll put in a link to in the notes beneath this video to give you a bit more background. But for now, we're going to move straight into the case studies. So I'm going to start off with a shorter one, which is the one around case studies. So I mean, case studies are not new. I mean, people have been using case studies in higher education uh, for an incredibly long period of time. And I'm sure it's something that's embedded into many of our uh, routine kind of teaching toolkits, so to speak. So, you know, w why this talk? Why am I talking about it? So this is derived from a very much personal experience with case studies, particularly when we allow students to tackle these case studies in a small group um, kind of exercise when you give them access to the internet, rightly so, in order to think about solutions, come up with ideas. That if you use a real case study, particularly one that is available in the public domain, there's this creeping tendency of students to look for the correct answer rather than explore potential answers. Now, of course, you can fabricate details to mimic that, which is the nature of this case study. So let me give you a little bit of background on how I did that, first of all. So um, this particular case study um, takes place in a module called Science Communication. Now, I've got the background details of the module in which it's applied, um, just to give you the context. The key takeaways are these are science students, and the focus is very much on communicating with the general public. So, you know, largely a non-academic audience, which I, mean, I guess is the focus of a lot of the kind of research work that takes part in these types of program. So it's a very discursive, practical module with some theoretical foundations followed by large practical exercises. Uh, and the module is assessed by something called a Zine, kind of like a digital scrapbook, where each week in class we have some kind of activity and the students choose two of two from the list of those in order to write up into their formal sign, incorporating the sign. So what you can see on the small black box here on your screen is uh, the headline news from one of these particular case studies. And if you're skimming it, you can see it's to do with low vaccine rates um, uh, and coming up with an appropriate course of action to engage the community. But here, the place is a town called Hammington with a population of 24,000. And it's got a statement about its demographic makeup. So there is some more detail on the full brief about Hammington. But this is just the headline news. So Hammington is made up. Hammington is not real. So when I first generated this case study, I did use a real place. And I found that people were too involved with trying to look for real details on this place. So I just created a fictitious place name. So uh, I've done this for years and I've, I've got to be honest with you, I've come quite, quite fond of Hammington um, as a place and I use it as a place throughout the whole module. I um, should say the students do know that this, this is not real. Um, so this year, the, the way I enhanced this, made it more authentic in my mind, was using generative in charge of artificial intelligence myself. <clears throat> so to start off with, I added some real flavour to um, the place. So I used um, um, 
excuse me, uh, Dali to create some um, images of Hamilton, which you can see on the top left. Um, then I asked it to create some specific images, specific places in Hamilton um, to give the students a, a picture in their mind's eye of the place that we're actually working to. So this was quite useful in the public consultation and considering the sort of geography and the landscape of this place, you know, and giving a feel of what, what the atmosphere may be like. After I'd done that, I asked um, it to create, you know, some of the key businesses in Hammington. I asked it to create a list of some of the residents of Hammington. Um, I had to re-ask this carefully and make sure it was more ethnically diverse. And then after that, I asked it to create some specific profiles for some of the names of the people that they'd generated. So it created Dr. Sahil Sharma, and I got a full profile for Sahil, background, his interests, um, his age, his family life, and those kind of things. Word of caution, these kind of profiles certainly need to be checked before they go live before a student, because these tools can create very stereotypical profiles for individuals. So what, why was I doing this? So I obviously got um, Dali to make an, an image of Dr. Sharma as well. So this is a fictitious image created, you know, by Dali here. So in one of the design exercises, we have an interaction where we profile, um, we use personas in the charity sector and we target specific people and think about the approaches we'd use. So now we've got a real resident of Hamilton in which we're, we, we, which we're processing and trying to uh, in, uh, work out the approach for. In a way, the things I've said so far are really window dressing. You know, they are contextual flavour to the case study. But when I did this this year, it really brought a new energy and vibrancy to the room, having this kind of relationship with the imagery and the additional text. I mean, when I was completely up front, I'd used Gen AI to create these. And actually, the students actually asked for some more Gen AI created content. In the last example I've got here, when um, students were... Um, thinking about um, informal science communication and the creation of cafe scientifiques, kind of like, you know, cafe chat kind of rooms, etc. They asked about the coffee shop in Hamilton. So we quickly went on Gen AI, um, asked them, asked it to create a name for um, a coffee shop. It gave a list. The students chose the one they liked. And I asked him to create a business profile for the Hamilton Coffee Collective, which it did. And I quickly nipped over to Dali and asked it to create an image for it. Yeah etc etc so before we knew it we've got a complete background to the coffee shop where this cafe scientific is going to be taking place um to add some flavor you know so it really added a lot of authenticity to what could have been a dry case study my, my second example is about ungoogable mcq exams so I use the word ungoogable because it's kind of catchy i guess and i guess it's come to for the fraud particularly in post covid when a lot of assessment went online particularly mcqs and a real concern that many in the community had about students either using google or going on some social chat platform or we uh, whatsapp or whatever and sharing the answers so that's really the mindset i'm coming from with this particular part of the talk just focusing on creating questions that can't be googled quickly or can't answers can't be shared quickly now is anything ungoogable i mean a debate that we can't have on the screen because I can't talk to you, but arguably no. But putting some, you know, some changing your question approach, make it more difficult to do so. I mean, I, I think there's a couple of other quick caveats before I just plow on. The first one is that, you know, the actual design of the test, you know, the construction of the question, the types of questions and how the test is weight and scored are really important pedagogical considerations you know i'm not really talking about this i'm gone down to the micro level detail and i think there's also the bigger question about our mcq exams right for measuring the learning outcome that you have particularly in the environment in which you're using them particularly if that's online once again bigger considerations um okay so let's go with some examples so i'm going to start off with, with an example called Google for them. So in this particular idea, I mean, we recognise that if we're giving students access to the internet to use, the, address their MCQ, and it's not proctored, you know, you know, students will use the internet. So why not play on that effect? So in the first of the two examples on the screen here, the idea is that you ask the students to 
basically look at something on the internet. So you give them a prompt, say, you know, this is the thing I want you to look up. You get them to go and look it up. But then the question, the learning outcome effectively is about what they understand from looking up the thing that you've gone to do. I mean, we all know that it's a real skill set in being able to rapidly, um, um, you know, assess information, critique it, etc. that you find, you know, um, otherwise we'd all be experts, wouldn't we? Um, so allowing the students to look at things up, but in, question their interpretation thereof. I mean, if you really want to restrict students using the internet, don't want to encourage that, of course, so you could do that yourself. You know, you could search for some definitions yourself and then ask students to critique what, you know, Google or Gen AI has come up with, you know, you know, what do you think of, you know, think of their answer, you know, and you're testing their understanding of it. Could they then go and Google or Gen, uh, use a tool to, you know, for the second phase, of course, but you're, you're putting an intrinsic limitation, particularly if this is some sort of timed assessment to be able to do those kind of things. You know, you're relying more on the students having the base level understanding. I mean, to give you a kind of a more tangible example, here's a question kind of written in both of those ways. So, you know, perhaps in a question you'd see typically on MCQ would be something like this. Which of the following is the correct definition of thing? Right. So uh, and then there's a list, you know, five or six options, whichever. I mean, that is so easy to find the answer to on Google in most cases, you know, or, or, or a Gen AI tool. You know, you know, there's a correct answer, you know. And the other answers have got to be, you know, wrong enough that they couldn't be accidentally picked. I mean, I use the word definition here and, and you know, later on I use differences, but they're only indicative. Of course, there's thousands of different way things come in the same kind of same kind of phraseology. Now, so perhaps you could have said type below an appropriate definition for thing. So they've therefore got to look up the definitions for, you know, the thing that you're looking for. And of course, if you look for the definition of a thing on on Google, you'll get thousands of hits, all which are slightly worded differently. So now the students got to, well, either select one or got to choose one which is the most or amalgamate the ones that they've got into an appropriate response to address the question. Or using appropriate definitions, state the fundamental differences between thing and another thing. So, you know, using... You know, so, you know, maybe they've got to Google two things, you know, A and B and talk about the differences between A and B. So now you are you, you're you're assessing their sort of the space between the two definitions they've just searched for. I mean, I, I like that one personally, because it doesn't matter what they search for. It's all about you understanding the space between them, interpret them. Or perhaps if you use the other approach. Using the two definitions below, which you could take them from Google or Gen AI state the fundamental differences between them. Now, of course, those two definitions can be put into Gen AI tools and the differences could be extracted. Um, but it's a harder thing for it to do. And you're relying on some underlying assumptions that you may have taught them in terms of necessary skill sets. So my next example is about question variation. So an example question, um, I mean, I've used a maths example, but I think you could use any kind of example here. You know, if the value of X is number and the beta constant is number, what is the thing? I mean, there's two easy ways to create some variety in here. You know, first of all, a pool of questions. So you create a series, you know, of 10 questions, all written the same, but with different numbers in X and beta. Or you just create a single question and you use the created formula function on your VLE in order to, you know, indicate a range which X and B could be. I mean, so, of course, in this type of question, you know, the formula or the principles are the same all the time, but the answers will be different. So think about students quickly sharing the answers in a time constrained environment. If they've all got different numbers, that makes that much more challenging to do. But I think double processing really helps as well here. So like if you have to the same question written above, but first of all, they've got to extract that data from a picture of a graph, then put it into the equation, you know, creates it much harder for something like a general tool in order to, to help solve that problem. Because they've got to work out to read the graph, read the correct part of the graph, you know, which could include some other data on it as well, then apply the equation. It just makes it more difficult for them to uh, easily, uh, um, you know, manipulate your question construction. 
And of course, this can be done on, on the VLE. It's just an example of how to do so. An example I like, I mean, it's, it's a childhood game, but spot the difference. But I mean, I think actually spot the difference are really good questions. So the idea is you create something unique. Um, so, you know, that could be a picture. Just to note that Dali, as we've already seen, can create unique images, um, create some new text. ChatGPT can create unique text, so on and so forth. Formula, mathematics, and ask them to interpret, interpret it, do something with it. You know, so, you know, there's a million ways that you can do this. But the benefit for the kind of the ungoogable kind of nature is it because the image is effectively unique, uh, you know, there's no easy way to, for them to search for that image. You know, it's relying on their understanding of whatever the phenomenon is that you're trying to describe. And with a bit of training, you can prompt the engineer all of those things to quite a good level to get something that's probably discipline specific uh, 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 and at the appropriate level that you wish to address. So next, I've got an example of the spot the difference. So, so identity. So in the blue box, I've got um, a, a typical question: identifying the things labelled A to E using the drop down list. So maybe you've got a list of definitions, and you've got to say from you know which one is which from a drop down list. Instead, here's my um, kind of spot the difference. So what I've here got. So, is a picture of loads of colored blocks. Look at the image, what thing is not included? And then I've got some statements about ratios. So it requires some interpretation, you know, of what a ratio is and some understanding of the, the, the image. I appreciate this is a little tangential in terms of the example, but I didn't want to include something discipline specific to put people off there particularly. Um, you know, perhaps another example will help. Um, so here's another example of the, the kind of thing. So read the passage of text below. Which of the statements is most valid in the context of things? So there's a statement and a series uh, and then a series of um, answers beneath it for. Now, they all could be relevant, but it's about the most valid is the key bit here. This is where the learning outcome comes in. You know, the most valid in the context of the thing that you give them. So, you know. It requires them to have an underlying knowledge of the thing in order to be able to apply that most valid concept to it. Uh, I mean, one thing I haven't mentioned for before is a lot of the questions I've just given you, you know, you know, could be open ended in terms of their kind of answer or at least short answer questions. When I guess a driver that for many people is the practicality MCQs choosing short answer questions. I mean, the spot the difference one I just gave you was still a series of options, but all of these questions could be adapted to include short sentence answer questions. But recognize, of course, the implication this may have in your marking practice. Um, I mean, short answer questions, you know, are really could have value. You can have less of them, but also allow things like rubrics to be embedded into the VLE, which could allow for quick marking. So they're not necessarily a massive barrier in terms of things. I think in the modern age, in the ungoogable era, we have to think a little bit differently, you know, about how we um, create our questions. I mean, I guess a traditional approach for creating MCQs, particularly at levels three and four, was to do things like looking across, you know, your individual lectures and looking at, even across individual slides at statements or pictures or sources you've got and deriving a question for something that was actually presented in front of to the students. I mean, obviously, these with the access to the Internet and the materials in front of them are very easy to pick off and solve. Instead, it might be worth thinking about the broader module, you know, con questions that merge across the concept of the module or even modules across, you know, the stage of a program, you know, incorporate multiple different areas, you know, and mixing up those things makes it much more challenging to, to do. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can actually use Jan Ayol to help do some of that synthesis yourself to derive these questions. I mean, never, you know, don't view these tools as the enemy. Gen AI can create MCQs for you. Um, I wouldn't suggest you actually use them, but they can get great ideas about the types of questions you could answer. I think it's probably also worth just mentioning, you know, one of the classical hierarchies uh, for magnet. Um, mapping cognitive um, uh, processes in higher education, which is Bloom's taxonomy. When you look at Bloom's, um, I guess there's traditionally a thought that much of 
MCQ kind of work is at the lower level end of the blooms. So the understanding and the knowledge level. But I think the higher parts of the blooms taxonomy, applying, analysing, evaluating, creating, can still suit themselves to MCQs in certain circumstances. And, it, you know, in here, I've got one example kind of question, very loosely phrased, against each dimension of this the Bloom's taxonomy. Um, um, you know, so for creating combined things, whatever they may be, in different ways to develop alternative solutions and products. So you give them a mini case study, effectively, with a couple of short prompts and ask them to come up with an idea. You know, so you are testing them in a MCQ environment, but asking for them to interpret some unique sources and come up with a unique solution. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to think about balloon stocks I mean, how you map in these assessments. So just to summarise, um, some further reading. Um, so link to the video, as I mentioned, and, you know, um, a lot of these ideas about on Google exams have come from the excellent uh, David Smith at Sherwood Hallam University, who's got um, two blogs uh, on his uh, WordPress site, which you can read to get some more detail. So thank you very much for listening.